We're glad to have everyone here this Sabbath. And let's just bow our heads again and ask for the Spirit of God to be present with us. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can come into your presence and had no for certainty that the Spirit is here with us to give us righteous discernment, heavenly wisdom and knowledge and understanding from your word. Thank you for being here, and we thank you in Christ's powerful name. Amen. Yes. Um, I forgot to mention, I don't know how many people know Tom and Helen Downey. How many people what? Know Tom and Helen Downey. Yes. But Helen Downey passed away. Right. Uh, Ron is saying that Helen Downey passed away this week. Have we heard about anything as far as funeral arrangements? No, there's, it's going to be back in Wyoming. She has a lot of family back there. Oh, yeah. it's going to be in Wyoming? Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that. Because yeah. <laughs> that's where they're from, really. Yeah. Okay. We've been studying the scriptures this whole quarter. And the scriptures is the best for history. We know for a fact when we study scripture that we're not raised and come through monkeys. That Christ set a day and it was the sixth day that man was created in the image of God. History, when Christ came, he changed history completely because now we're living, instead of before Christ, we're re living after he came, after his death. History, very important. And one of the reasons why I like history so much is that it has a tendency to repeat itself. So we can learn lessons if we will just take the time to study history. And that's what we're going to do a little bit today, is the Bible, using the Bible as history. And we're going to start talking about David and Solomon and the monarchy. The children of Israel have been you know, the famine came. Joseph had been sent, sold by his brothers by a band, to a band of Midianites. 
20 pieces of silver because they absolutely hated his statements that, that he was going to be the one that they would actually bow down and worship someday. They were jealous of him. Jacob had spoiled him rotten. He was the only one that had a beautiful coat. And it was by this coat that his brothers took to Jacob and said, we found this. You think it's David? Well, everyone knew it was, or not David. You think it was Joseph? Everyone knew it was Joseph. And it was soaked with blood. Some he had met his death probably by a ferocious animal. Who knows? But they were taking the blame away from themselves. And then Jacob was sending his sons to Egypt every now and then to get food because there was a famine in the land. It was, the famine was so severe that all, the nations of the earth at that time had to depend on Egypt to survive. And when Joseph gave the interpretation to the king, to the pharaoh, of what his dream was about, it was that they're going, we're going to have a time of plenty and we need to save because after the seven years of plenty, it's going to be rough. There's not going to be any food unless we have saved it. And so the Pharaoh actually made this young man, Joseph, who had been in a prison cell, accused of messing with his master's wife. The master knew pretty well knew that he was innocent. And therefore, he didn't have him killed like that. He had to have a little honor, and so he put him in prison. And he was there for quite a while. And then when he told the vision, told the meaning of the vision to the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh made him second in command, vice president. Prime Minister, whatever you want to call it. And he was in charge of dispersing this food that they had put in storage during those seven years. Jacob's brothers came. You know the story. They didn't recognize him, but he recognized them. And he played some little tricks with them just to see how their heart was. And he would give Phil the bag and then he would tell the people, put the money back in the bag, let them go. Well, they took off, went home. They found the money in the bag. Oh my, now we've had it. We, next time we go, They'll think we robbed them. But after the corn and food ran out, and I think it was corn, it may have been potatoes, but it was a basic food that kept them alive. During the Irish famine, Dottie and I had a baked potato last night, and I said, this food here saved the Irish. And afterwards, many of them uh, came to the States to live because there was no food. They settled in, in New York, mostly. And they even almost took over the country by having St. Patrick's Day. Food is very important. I don't know what the food was, but I think it was corn. Personally, that's what I think it was. Well, that ran out and they went back 
to Egypt to get more. And they said, there was a mistake made. Our money was not given. It was in our bags. We want to give you that. And then we brought more money so we can buy more corn or more food. And so he had told them, uh, now when you come the next time, he asked them about their f family history. I want you to bring, they said their youngest was at home, that these were the sons of Jacob, but the youngest was at home. He said, I want you to bring him with you. Well, you know what Jacob thought about that. You're not taking my son. I've already lost Joseph. And of course, Joseph and Benjamin were both mothered by his true love, Rachel. It's not that he didn't love Leah, but he was forced into that marriage by secrecy. He didn't know until after the wedding that it was Leah instead of Rachel. He had worked seven years for this bride and oh, he longed to have her and get all these wedding garments and these masks off. You're not the one. So he went to his father-in-law and says, you gave me the wrong woman. She's the oldest. The oldest goes first. But if you want the other one, if you'll work for me seven more years, I'll give you her. And we know the story. Leah had six boys and a daughter. Rachel had two boys and actually died in childbirth with Benjamin. There's a, if you go to the Holy Land, there's a marker between Jerusalem and near Bethlehem, and it's the tomb marker of Rachel. And we thought that quite interesting. I've been to several famous people's funeral, or not funeral, to their being laid away, and there's none of them that any more fancy than the Taj Mahal in India. This king in India built this beautiful, it was almost a mansion. Well, it is, it, it's just gorgeous when his young bride died. Rachel didn't have that kind of very plain, very simple. Then, of course, he had two children each by the maid of Leah and two by the maid of Rachel. So there was 12 boys, one daughter. Do you think she was spoiled? <laughs> she was spoiled so bad that when she was abused in a relationship that she wanted to marry a certain man, two of them, who were the two? Levi and Simeon, or Simon. Simeon, I like the E ending, that's better. Simeon, they went through, they got them all drunk, and they went through and killed them. And Jacob says, you've ruined us. We will stink in this community. And they had to move away. Can you imagine two brothers killing all the males in that town because they had abused her daughter, their sister? That's what happened. So we, we read the history of the children of Israel, and they were slaves after the Pharaoh died that knew not Joseph, they, had, they became slaves. And they had grown and grown and multiplied over 400 years. They went down to Egypt. When they went down to Egypt, how many went? 71 
people. That was the sons and Jacob and their wives and what children they had at that time. 71. When they came out of Egypt, how many were there? 602,500 men that were above the age of 19. So really, there was a million, half, two million people that came out of Egypt. When Moses led them out of Egypt, I would say there was at least two million, maybe three million. Because they had a lot of kids in those days. And now we, the children of Israel have gone through this terrible time. They lived through the passing it through the Red Sea. If you were marching and the enemy was behind you and the sea was in front of you and you were told, step right in, I don't think very many of us would do it. But God performed a miracle in their life and he separated the water and made a path for them to go through. It's going to take a little while for two and a half three million people to pass through. But when they did, the Egyptians, oh, we'll just go after them and get them. And as the Egyptians got into the water, the, lot, the waves came down and destroyed them. God has led his people. And the Hebrew nation was formed at that time. God's called them as his people. And we've seen through the whole Bible, as you read the history of the whole Bible, how God has led his people. They went through a period of time of judge, where judges were in charge. And one of the most famous judges was Samuel. And there was other judges. Who was the one that fought with 300 men? You remember Gideon? When I went to, um, when I was in the Army, I was sent to the Command and General Staff College of the Army. And yet, you had to pick us a, a subject on what how to be a leader, how you would deploy your soldiers. I picked Gideon as my subject. I didn't know if they would accept that or not, but they did because I approached it from the surprise attack that they had. He had a hundred here, a hundred there, a hundred there, and they all broke their lamps at the same time. And they actually thought that they were completely surrounded by a huge multitude. And they started fighting with each other. And they were wiped out. Same way that the army was ripe, wiped out as we studied the lesson this week of Sennacherib. Who was Sennacherib? He was the emperor of the eight. Assyrian Empire. There's been seven, actually six so far, but there will be seven empires that are listed in the Bible. Seven in the Bible means completeness. The seven empires that have existed, we know them. We know them as Egypt, Assyria, after that, Daniel gave the vision, and we had Babylon, and then Persia, and then Greece, and then pagan Rome, the sixth. Would pagan Rome become the little horn but it was continu a continuation of Rome, really. 
and then the rock comes down that's cut out without a man's hand and strikes the image at its feet and grinds it to powder, and that seventh kingdom is the kingdom that you and I are going to live in, the kingdom of Christ. Over there, when Christ went back to heaven in, in the book of Revelation 4, it talks about his re -enthronement. He sits at the right hand of God. And because of what Christ did for us, God gave him all power in heaven and in earth and under the earth. And if we need help, that's who we need to call, call on. Jesus, help me. Peter called on that when he thought he would step out in the water and go to him. Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. He said, come on. And he got out of the boat and started walking. And I thought, oh, this is pretty good. Hey, turn around and look at his other disciples. Hey, look at me. I'm walking on the water. He took his eyes off of Jesus. And when he did, he sunk. And his first cry was what? Help me. Jesus, help me. And Christ comes up and picks him up, gets into the boat. And he, peel, he feels very ashamed that he had goofed. But Christ, if we call on Christ when we need help, he will help us. And that's what I do on a regular daily basis. My wife says to me, you're pretty lucky sometimes. Because I leave a cane or I leave something somewhere and I end up finding it and getting it back. I said, well, the Lord's with me. He helps me. And I believe that with all my heart. He, it's a miracle that is performed by Christ when our sins are forgiven. He's the only person. God through Christ is the only being that can cleanse us from sin, who can forgive us of sin. A priest can't do it. A pastor can't do it. It is Christ that does it. It's a miracle that takes place. And not only does he forgive our sins, but he makes us sinless. Blameless is the word. Job was a man of, that was blameless before God. Job said to the, de uh, several, uh, to the devil when they came together for a council meeting, where are you coming from? Well, I come down from earth. I come up from earth. Well, we do. Well, you might know my good friend, Job. Oh, yeah, I know Job. But he's only good because you put a fence around him. And if you take all that away, he'd deny you. He would forsake you. OK? If you think that way, I'm going to let you try. You cannot take his life. You do what you want, but you can't take it. Well, we know what happened to Job. He lost everything he had financially. He lost all of his children. He got boils all over his body. Anyone had a boil? Boy, I had a boil one time on my face. It is painful. He had boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And his wife, he was in terrible pain and he was praying and his wife said to him, why don't you curse God and die? Woman, you don't know what you're talking about. That's what he told her. He never forsake God. 
His, his friends came and actually became his enemies. And in the end, Job had a family again. He had more cattle than he had before. He had more sheep than he had before. And his daughters were beautiful and they set a, an example for the rest of the nation that the, the daughters of the family were included in the will. Women were mistreated, but Job did not mistreat these daughters. He, they were part of the, of the will. History, the Bible is history. And we've been studying about different ones. When you get to heaven, you're going to see people that are just like you. And you're going to see some of these heroes of the Bible. They're just like you. They're human beings who have done God's will. He called Abraham for the most prosperous city that was ever formed. Ur of the Chaldees, in, in near Babylon. And he said, I want you to go to a land different. Oh, I, he didn't say, I don't, I don't think I can do that. I've, I've got my job here, my residence, my farm, my kids, everything there. But he went and he became the father of many people. He we know he only had two children, Ishmael, the oldest by Hagar, the maid of Sarah, and then, of course, Isaac. Isaac was born when his mother was 90 year old. She was past the time of childbearing. But he performed a miracle. And Isaac was born. And then Jacob. And now all these people through the Bible came along. And you think, well, they're, they're, they were righteous and very good. Yes, some of them were. But you know, included in that list of people of faith is a woman who was a prostitute. The Bible says she was a harlot. Who, who was she? You remember the woman who took the spies when they were spying out the land? They, she hid them from those that were searching for, for them. And she asked to be saved when, when Jericho was going to be attacked, and they saved her. Her name was Rahab. And she actually became part of the lineage of Christ. Amazing. And then, of course, David, after the judges, he was not the first king. Saul was the first king. David was a young man when he was anointed by Samuel. How many brothers did David uh, did uh, David have? Jesse was his father. How many brothers did he have? Seven. There was eight boys in the family, and David was the youngest. And three of the the older boys and the oldest one included Eli. They went with Saul to fight against the Philistines. And so Jesse, the father, wanted to send David. And to find out, he gave him food to take along, gave presents to, to give to their company, his, the, kid, uh, the soldiers, uh, company commander. And he went up there. And he saw a sight that he had never seen. 
he saw an army on one hill, the Philistines. And he saw the Israelites on another hill, and in between a valley. And twice a day, for 40 days, this giant comes up. I told you a little bit about him last week. I said that when he went to pick up the stones to put in his little bag, that he picked up five smooth stones. And I said that that was for his brothers. It was for his son. He had four sons, big giant, big soldiers. And so David not only picked up one to kill him, but he picked up enough to kill the four sons. And in fact, David was responsible for the death of those four sons. Not at the same time, but at a different time. As you read the, the history of it in the Bible. And then we see him go before this giant. And I told you last week, even the, the Seventh-day Adventist commentary can't agree on exactly how tall he was. One place in the commentary says he was nine and a half inches. Another commentary, same Bible, I mean same commentary, different volume and, and, or different page number, says that he was about 12 feet. Either way, it's a lot taller than me. <laughs> Either way, he was greater than they. He had a mail coat, defensive armor that weighed 150 pounds. He carried a spear with him, or a hat javelin, whatever you want to call it. The head of it was 15 pounds. And he had a sword on his side. And then he sees this teenage boy come down with nothing. What are you? He had his shepherd's rod. He said, you, you, you think that you can come to me like a dog with a stick in your hand? Well, I'm going to take your head right off and feed it to the birds and to the fowl and to the creatures. He was really angry. He got so angry, we know what happened. He threw the helmet on. He was protected. His armor, a, a dart could not go through it or an arrow could not go through it because it was so w well f fixed. But when he threw his helmet back, he exposed his forehead. And he started walking to David and David started running to him and he reached in his bag and got the rock out and placed it into the sling. And David had told him, well, what you say you're going to do to me is what I'm going to do to you. Because you have defied the living God of our army. And I can just, I visualize him running along and throwing this sling around and then and we're told it hit him in the forehead. The only spot that was open after he threw his helmet back didn't kill him. The shot did not kill him. If you read the Desire of Ages in uh, uh, it, uh, Prophet, Prophets and Kings, you'll find out he staggered around he like he was drunk and then he sort of fell to the ground, but he was still alive. David ran up, stood on him, drew his sword out, the giant, Goliath's sword out, and chopped his head off. Well, these armies absolutely, the Philistines become, ooh, wee, and they started running. And the Israelites, they went down off the mountain, down into the valley, and they chased them clear home, and they killed many people. They went back and they sacked their tents and took all their spoils. 
David in his tent that he had, he put the, the giant's armor, but he took the head and took it to Jerusalem. What a victory. That's history of the Bible. We not only have the history of, of uh, David and, and Solomon, we have the history of Isaiah, Hezekiah, and Sennacherib. I told you about Sennacherib. He was the emperor of the Assyrian Empire. And in one night, I've been in combat. I was with an infantry unit. And I know what it is to be in combat. And my job was an aid man to help those that were in my unit. I had a, a platoon of men that I was in charge of health-wise. And if they got wounded, boy, the first thing they say, medic, and you better go. Because that's your job. In this case, 185,000 soldiers were killed. The Bible says the angel of the Lord. Well, who is the angel of the Lord? If you take the uh, commentary, and you looked up in the index of the writings of Ellen White. She mentions how Christ had several different disguises as he came to planet Earth. One time, he came as an angel of the Lord. Another time, he came in a burning bush and he was told to take this. He told Moses, take this shoes off. You're on holy ground. He came in different ways. I think that angel of the Lord was Christ. Because if you read the spirit of prophecy, the word angel is capitalized. <clears throat> when she talks about divinity, she, cop she capitalizes the names of Christ, of God, of the Holy Spirit. And I think that the angel of the Lord, that's my personal opinion. It may not. It may have been the same angel that appeared to John on the island of Patmos. And who was that angel? Gabriel. Who was Gabriel? He's the one that took the place of Lucifer. Now who's Lucifer? The devil. He had so much influence with the angels that one third of the heavenly host fell and went with him and became demons. One third. Now, how much is one third? Well, there were millions of angels. If each Christian has an angel as his guardian angel, there's over a billion Christians. There's over a billion Islamic Muslims. There's over a billion Hindus. But Christians, we know, have a guardian angel. So how many is a third of a billion? Millions. Millions. Amazing. Grace. Okay, let's... I was saying that these people are just like we are. And we can become that person that God wants us to be. Over there in the book of Philippians, in Philippians 4.13 is this text. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You get it? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And what we do, we don't do through ourselves. We don't become saved by something that we do. We become saved by the fact of what Christ has done already for us. And what did he do? He hung on a cross. He went through terrible pain and suffering. And he hung on a cross. And finally had a spear stuck into his side. And his blood cleanses us. We are to have that cleansing power of the blood. Over there in the book of Revelation, it talks about the Laodicean church. And the Laodicean church was one of the seven churches of Asia Minor. But it is also a, depicted as a symbol of the last church before Christ comes again. And he has given us a message in the book of Revelation. The latest end, they were, they didn't feel need of anything. They had everything. But he says, I want you to wash your robes in the blood of Christ. I want you to buy for me eye salve. They had made an eye salve at their medical school there. That was the best in the world. It cured eye problems. And he has, Christ has an eye set for us. He has cleansing power for us. Any thoughts anyone wants to bring up? We have examples. I'm going to see these people. I want to talk to them. I know you do too. And the way we do it is to have a yearning desire to become Christ. And he will make us that person that God wants us to be. Okay, that's it.